So as I said, prayer. That's what we're talking about. If you brought a Bible today, feel free to open it up. We're going to be mostly in the book of Acts, in Acts 4. That's where I'll primarily camp out. I'll I'll have a few other scripture references. There are pew Bibles underneath the seats. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the Welcome Center for you to take when you leave here. It's a blue Bible. Take it home with you so you have your own Bible. If you have an iPhone, iPad, whatever you got, if it's got the Word of God in it, let's get it and let's use it. Uh, Acts 4 is where, like I said, we are mostly going to camp out. And in my prayer and in what I'm asking you today is that every single person here hearing my voice, whether you're listening here, maybe you'll listen to it online later, if you would commit yourself to join me and join us in a season of intentional prayer. A season of intentional prayer specifically for this church. Because I believe that it is essential that every member be involved in the process of prayer. There, there's incredible power and resources available to us when the church prays. Now, along with that thought, uh, today I want to talk to you about what it is that we can expect on an individual level, but also on a corporate level when we come together and pray. There's a lot, a lot that can be had in this. Now, if you know about the early church, the records of the early church point to prayer as its dominant feature. The early believers knew that going into it, they were responsible for one another's well-being. They were to be salt and light into the world, right? And one way that they demonstrated that responsibility was by praying for the hurts, by praying for the needs of those around them. And just as the members of the early church prayed for the needs of the people around them, so too are we called to pray. Because you see, prayer unlocks the storehouse of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is and all that God has is at our disposal through prayer. And as I've already mentioned, I want to extend to you this invitation to be involved in this, this invitation to enter into a special season of prayer for our church and its effectiveness in reaching our community. The Apostle Paul likewise asked the church at Rome to do this very thing, to enter into a special time of prayer with him. Romans 15.30 says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God. As we work our way towards Easter, hard to think that's coming already, right? But Christmas is in the rear of your mirror now. We've got to be looking ahead. And Easter's coming. And I don't know if you've noticed, but over the last 6, 8, 10, 12 months, we've had quite a number of people coming, kicking the tires of the church, right? And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Keep inviting your friends, your family, your neighbors, your enemies. Keep doing it because they need to hear the word of God. And as we work our way towards Easter, we will hopefully continue to see this trend of more and more new faces coming and just checking us out and seeing who we are, what we're about. And folks, we need to be prayed up and be ready for that. Now, early in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, we find that Peter and John had been arrested and put into prison for preaching in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead, it says in Acts 4.2. As they appeared before the religious authorities and the high priests, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he speaks out with great boldness, proclaiming about Jesus that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12, right? Right? And then the apostles at that point are warned by the religious bigwigs of their time to no longer teach, not even to speak the name of Jesus. They say, John and Peter, shut up. Knock it off. What was Peter's response? Peter says to the assembly, he says, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but to speak about that which we have heard. Acts 4, 19 and 20. 
And then after that, they were further threatened by the religious leaders. And then they were released. And that brings us to where I want to focus on today. So if you do have your Bible, open it up to Acts 4.23. And we're going to stay in 23 through 32 primarily for the rest of our time. I'm going to read this for you. It's a, a, a longer passage, but I'm going to read it to you because it's good to hear the word of God read. Acts 4.23, and it says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heaven and the earth and the seas and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. When things get rough, when we have a problem, when we have trials, when things aren't going the way that we want them to, who should we turn to? The example we see here very clearly in Scripture is that these men went to the very people who cared for them and who would pray for them, right? Part of being a Christian means that you belong to a local body of believers. And refusal to be part of that and to submit oneself to the authority of the local church opposes the plan that the Lord Jesus Christ, the builder of the church, put together for us. And it also causes people to miss out because they have no local church to go to, no place to serve as their spiritual home when the world begins to persecute them, when there's pressures, when there's trials, when there's troubles, when there's problems. They have no one to turn to. Can you come here to glory in your time of need? I sure hope you believe that you can. You see, Peter and John did just that, as we read in Acts 4.23. It says, on their release, Peter and John, once they were let out of jail, once they got out of prison, upon their release, they went back and saw their people, the church, the ecclesia, the gathered ones. We see the very same thing happen in Acts 12 as well. Herod had put Peter into jail, but the angel of the Lord comes and he rescues him. And when he suddenly realizes that he's free, Peter, it says in Acts 12, went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where the people had gathered and were praying. Acts 12, 12. Peter gets sprung, and the first thing he does is he goes and meets with his church people. Now, they didn't have church buildings like we have in those days, but he went and gathered with his people. And we all need a place to go home to. And the church should be that home. Here at Glory, prayer is offered on behalf of those who are suffering. And it's here where we need to be able to come and share our burdens as well as our joys with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Being a member of the local church is a great privilege as well as responsibility. If you're following along and you're keeping notes, first note there for us as to why it is we do this is because prayer for us as Christians is a response 
to God. When Peter and John were released from jail, they saw this release as evidence of the grace of God at work in their lives. Is God working in your life? What do you have as evidence? Have you stopped then to to praise him for what he has done for you? In the early church, every form and appearance of God's grace was cause for prayer by his disciples. So how are we doing on that? When the disciples were released and then rejoined the waiting Christians, they immediately, immediately, they get out of jail, they go meet the people, and immediately an impromptu worship service breaks out. Right? Praise the Lord. And they were thanking God for the outcome of their first significant encounter with those who did not like the fact that they were Christians. And apparently, they just instinctively broke into prayer. Now, if you know the backstory here, this was a time of amazing transformation among the disciples, right? Just a, a short little while ago, these were the same men who fell asleep while Jesus had said, guys, can you stay awake and just pray for me? I'm going to go over here and pray for a little bit. Could you just, I'm not asking much, just stay awake. Jesus comes back and Peter's like a chainsaw. Right? The disciples are all asleep. These are the same men who, one of them's like, when he's asked, Hey, weren't you the guy hanging out with Jesus the other day? Oh, no, not me. Uh-uh. It wasn't me. Somebody must look like me. No, no, no. You got the wrong guy, right? Three times Peter denied him. Just a short while ago, these were the guys who fell asleep, who denied Jesus on the very night in which he was betrayed by Judas. Then these men, as we just heard, experience the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them at Pentecost. And now here, just a very short time later, we see them spontaneously breaking out in prayer, responding to God, setting them free. Now, it would be easy to understand why the men who were in jail would praise God, right? That makes sense. They'd just been set free. But we see that it is more than that. When members of the church heard the apostles' report, it says that they all raised their voices together in prayer to God. The most powerful prayer is the prayer offered to God by His people united in spirit. Let me give you a real-world example of that. How many of you have ever been to a good old-fashioned horse pull? Right? Where they hook the horses up to a wagon of a predetermined weight and they see which team of horses or which individual horse, depending on the competition, is the strongest. You guys been to that? Back in southern Minnesota, we got some of those occasionally and, and they used to be far more common. Now they do them with big old trucks and, you know, flame throwing 12 engine monstrous things and giant tractors and stuff. There's a whole, like, pro sports league you can watch on TV if you don't know of trucks that do this. But I'm talking about these horses particularly. Amazing animals. Um, I got Doug and Judy Lee here from my church in Wasika today visiting and, and they could attest. We had this guy who was a, a retired pastor in my church. His name was Pastor Jack. And Pastor Jack and his wife, they raised Belgian horses. You ever seen a Belgian horse? A Belgian horse at its shoulder is often six feet high. And they average at least 2,000 pounds an animal. And some will weigh more than your car. Now, if you hook up one of these horses to a pulling sled, they can pull an incredible amount. These animals are like, they're like the Arnold Schwarzenegger. They're chiseled. 
with muscle. It ripples when they walk. Just, they're just, they're amazing. Right? Every horse looks at them and goes, man, he must really lift weights, right? Hitting the gym again. These are, these are amazing animals. They really are. And they can pull an incredible amount. They're bred to pull. And, and an individual Belgian horse can pull twice or more, a little over, its own body weight. That's pretty phenomenal. But here is the amazing thing. If instead of hooking one horse, you hook up two horses, the two horses join together instead of doubling, they can pull four times their combined body weight as they pull together. Joined together, they are incredibly strong compared to doing it on their own. It works this very same way in our prayers too. God's power through prayer, through his church, the greater we have togetherness, the stronger it will be. When we come together, as scripture says, wherever two or three or more are gathered, there is strength in numbers. There was a reason when Jesus sent out his disciples, he didn't send them out one by one, but he sent them out in pairs. We are created spiritually to be in relationship with one another. And when we pray together, it is far stronger than when we do it alone. When we come together, when we join forces in prayer, great things can happen. So I dare you to try. For the next 21 days, I dare you. I challenge you. I'll even beg you if you want me to. <clears throat> Try it. Join us. Second note in your notes there is that prayer is recognition of what God is doing. Prayer is a recognition of God. Acts 4.24 starts a prayer. It says, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. He said, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. 27 again it says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Most of this prayer is a simple recognition that God is sovereign. The word for sovereign Lord here is the Greek word despota. This is the very word that we get in English, the word despot from. And it means one who has absolute authority. And it means here that God has absolute authority over his universe and over his church. You see, the the people, the church, were appealing to the highest authority for their protection. And they presented themselves. If you read this in the Greek, it says it pre- they present themselves as servants, as doulos. As servants or slaves is how it literally translates. They present themselves to God. They were not making demands of Him. One thing we need is to have a view of God that is large before we can see how truly small our problems are. We must understand that this God, the the, the God of all creation, the God who created everything, right? The one who maintains it all, the one who rules it all, the one who owns it all. That God, that very same God is the one we get to raise our prayers to. 
And the implication, of course, is that the, the Creator, God, is more powerful than those that He has created. He is greater than your problems. He's greater than our financial struggles. He's greater than our struggles to raise our kids and grandkids. He's greater than our struggles with our health. God is greater than whatever it is. God is greater than it all. Unless we understand how great God is, we will continually sell Him short. If our view of God is too small, we will fail to seek after Him in our times of pain and sorrow. And then we'll forget to praise Him in those times when we are blessed. In verse 25 and 26, if you heard that there, you might know that is a, a quotation that comes from Psalm 2, 1 and 2, uh, from King David. And, and, and it's a, a passage there concerning the power of those who are opposed to God. The verse says, it's speaking about why do the nations rage, which in the original Greek was used to describe a sound that is made. You ever, well, you maybe not, but you ever heard a horse that was hurt, the way they kind of squeal in pain and agony? Since we were talking about horses, that's kind of the sound that comes to mind here. And when it says that the nations rage, in the original language, that, that's... That's this sound again, uh, thinking of horses, this, this spirited sound, this strength and, and noise and the volume. William Barclay, who's a, a guy who wrote commentaries on all the Bible, he comments in this passage, he says that these horses, that sound, that they may trample and toss their heads, but in the end they have to accept the rain. The discipline of the rain. The enemies of God, they can make an awful lot of noise. They can have great, great plans. But it's all in vain. It's all empty. Even what seemed as the greatest defeat of Christ with His death upon the cross, God foresaw that coming and turned it into the greatest victory of all. We see in verse 28 that the early church found great comfort in the fact that the God that they prayed to was the creator of heaven and earth, the sovereign God over all of the universe, who was totally in control of all that happened. Should they be concerned that mere men were threatening them to stamp them out of God's kingdom if they didn't shut up about Jesus? Of course not. They are on the right side, the side of God, the God of all history. What could mere men do to them? Because of their focus on God, the apostles in the early church saw the persecution that they faced as an ongoing resistance to Christ and his kingdom. And in light of what God has said, they saw this resistance as futile and foolishness. Because, folks, the kingdom of God cannot be stopped. And because of this, they could not and they would not be silenced. That third and final note you got there. Prayer is a request to God. Look at verse 29 now. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great Boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is how sold out the early Christians were to proclaiming the good news of Christ. Their concern was not about the danger around them, the danger for their own health and well being. Their concern was not for their own safety. Their concern was that these people might rob them of their ability to serve. And so they prayed for boldness. 
The threats from the religious leaders were intended to silence the church from speaking the name of Jesus. And so their request to have boldness in their speech, their prayer for boldness and confidence was an admission of their own fallibility as Christians. I mean, it would be easy for them to go, oh yeah, we'll lighten up a little bit, right? We don't want to offend anybody. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to force my religion on them, right? I don't want them to think I'm some sort of Bible thumper. I don't want them to think I'm a zealot religious freak. I'll lighten up a little. Sure, fine. Is that what we're supposed to do? I don't think we see that in Scripture here. It would be easy to shrink back and just fall back into safety. But they, they knew that wasn't the right path. But they also knew they couldn't do this on their own. They knew they were weak. But they also knew that God was with them. And so they prayed for boldness. Verse 31 closes by saying, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God boldly. Certainly when we encounter God in a fresh way, one of the byproducts is courage. This helps us understand when Paul says in Romans 8.31, when he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? It's not surprising that we find verse 31 ending with an announcement here that the believers spoke the word of God boldly. They knew God was with them. They did. They knew he wasn't going to let anything happen to them that could destroy them, be it prison, be it threats, be it persecution. They knew no matter what, God would be with them. And nothing was going to get in their way. So the question we have to ask is, is the church in this book of Acts any different than the church today? Should it be? No. The very God that they prayed to is the same and very God that we pray to. The God who shook them can and will shake us. The God who filled them with the power of the Holy Spirit is the same God and the same Holy Spirit who can fill us. The God who empowered them to speak boldly is the very same God who empowers you and me. So what I want to do today is just challenge you. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be just some ordinary Christian. And I don't want to be the pastor of just some ordinary church. It's not what I want to be. I don't really care about the size of our church, but I do care a great deal about the spirit of our church. And so I want to challenge you with these three things. First, wherever you might be today spiritually, commit your heart to God anew. We're going to take communion in a moment, and that's the perfect time for you to do that. Second, commit yourself to the body of Christ. And then third, commit yourself to be used of God through this church. God is doing great things here, folks. I see amazing things happening in people's lives. Families and kids far from God coming on Wednesday night. It's beautiful. Giving Bibles away to people who've never owned a Bible before. Wonderful. Praying with people who are hurt and broken and don't even know how to pray. That's awesome. Now is the time for us to get off of dead center. Now is the time for us to get involved. And we need you, each and every one of you, to pray for our church. 
and then we need you to work to help us to reach this community and then the world beyond. We need you to continue committing your resources and continue to step up in amazing ways. God is moving, folks, and I want to be part of it. And I want you to have ownership in that. I want you to know that you have, are, and can make an amazing difference both here and now as well as for all of eternity. So I'm asking you today to commit yourself to making this something other than an ordinary church. Because I think God has great things in store for us, all of us, you and for me. Think that over while we watch this video and then I'll close us in prayer and we'll move to communion.